So this is a joint work with uh, Mike Kovacic, who is in uh, Santiago de Chile. Um, I thought I would be the only one giving a black uh, talk, but apparently there's going to be another one this afternoon. Um, all right, so let me just write down the equation and uh, explain then the motivations and, and, and what we show. Uh, so, okay, the heat flow. I'm going to write it in this way. Um, so, this is the heat flow. So U uh, depends on T, on variables T and X. And I'm going to take S, X, the space variable in a, in a periodic setting. Uh, not really because uh, we cannot do things with boundaries, but just to keep things uh, the simplest possible and to focus on the, on the, on the entire effects that we're interested in. And uh, here, you uh, take values into R2, right? So when it takes values into R2, it's Ginsburg Lando, and if it takes values into R, it's Allen Kahn. Uh, but really, it's the uh, same thing, just the target changes. Um, <clears throat> and there's going to be a, an initial condition. Okay, um, so it's uh, it's actually the, the gradient flow of the Ginsburg Lando energy. So let me just uh, write that down. It's, it's uh, then to gradient flow, uh, except I modified the scaling a little bit here, the time scale, uh, but you could see it like that, uh, where this E epsilon is your usual Ginsburg Land energy that we saw in several talks yesterday. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here the, I, I have this epsilon squared, so the time scale is really, really slow. Um, and, um, uh, and that's because I mean, the effect that we want to see is that it's really slow uh, uh, time scale, as you will see. Okay, so um, this uh, in energy, it has been uh, studied uh, quite a lot by, uh, I guess, physicists and mathematicians. Um, <coughs> And uh, I mean, when you talk about it, I guess you have to cite uh, the book by Betuel Brésis and Elin, and I will come back to some of the results later. Um, and in the beginning, it was uh, uh, like, I mean, in the mathematics literature, people presented it as a, as a simplified model for, uh, for superconductors. The way we uh, became actually interested in it was, uh, came from um, pneumatic liquid crystals. So let me just... Uh, and give a brief uh, explanation of, of, of why, why we asked ourselves uh, the question that I will ask. Uh, it was really related to this, uh, the, this basic uh, uh, liquid crystal cell, so with uh, homeotropic anchoring, and the point is what happens near uh, the Friedrichs, so I don't know how to write it, so I just put an F, uh, transition. So what what is that system? You have you have your cell. Uh, it's quite thin, and inside you have you have pneumatic liquid crystal. And at the top and bottom boundary, it wants it wants to anchor uh, perpendicularly. And now you apply a voltage to your cell, right? And um, depending on the on the strength of the electric field, you will either see uh, so say the anchoring is strong enough that here yeah, the boundary it will not move too much. Uh, but really what, uh, what I'm interested in here is what happens in the middle. And you will either see things pointing up. Okay, this is, would be like this is the constant solution. It has a, it is a, like maybe the, the simplest thing you, you can think of. And if there is no applied field, uh, this is really like the, the stable solution. But when you increase the, the, the applied field at some point, uh, it starts uh, becoming unstable if you have the right uh, material constants. And so this, in my equation, will correspond to u equals zero. This is the, 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 the simple state. And then you can, uh, the electric field wants the, the molecules to align uh, away from it, so perpendicular to it. 
So when you start just about the transition, I mean, instead of being uh, uh, just aligned like that, say it will start deviating a little bit. But here, of course, you have uh, you have a degeneracy, right? It can start deviating in any direction here. Okay, so this would be uh, this would correspond to uh, U as a positive modulus. <coughs> you have this degeneracy here that you can be in the whole uh, unit circle. And when you are near the, the this uh, transition, um, <coughs> uh, when you you start, uh, this is the effect it has. And locally, I mean, maybe the molecules which are, will uh, will choose any of those orientation on the circle that they can choose. Uh, so uh, eventually they will all align in one direction, but and, uh, when you have not reached equilibrium yet, uh, you have this thing that will align uh, somewhere on S1, and um, it will create defects inside, uh, inside, uh, <coughs> inside your, your cell. And uh, so, I mean, why, why, why were we interested in that? Is because the, there is this, uh, this group in Chile, uh, around Marcel Claire in Santiago, who uh, they, they do experiments like really looking at the non-equilibrium uh, effects near this transition, and then they apply um, periodic voltage and they see uh, patterns that, uh, that form. I mean, they have a lot of very uh, beautiful pictures. And we're thinking, I mean, let's try and understand these things. Um, so they, they have a formal analysis to say, I mean, you can model that kind of effect uh, with really with the, that type of equation. Maybe there should be an inertia term, but uh, we will just forget about it for now. And, um, and so we wanted to understand what they were doing, but then we realized that just, uh, I mean, what happens when you start the flow uh, from something that is very close to zero, um, that we knew no uh, mathematical reference about it. Um, to understand, I mean, when, when this U0 is very close to zero, uh, we didn't know how to do that. So, uh, from uh, quite uh, from the ambitions that we had in the beginning, I mean, we just settled for okay, let's let's try and understand that simple thing. And so, this is really uh, this is really like uh, what we want to understand in in that equation here. How you get from something that is very close to zero to something that has formed vortices. Um, all right. So, I mean, I'm sorry about the physical explanation because actually I don't know um, much about that, but uh, okay, now we have this equation and, uh, and we want to understand uh, what it does. <coughs> right. Uh, so, uh, there are vortices in my title and we saw those vortices also many times in the talks uh, during the week. So, let me just say a few more words about it. Okay, so vortices. Um, so if you look at a configuration, uh, U epsilon that has uh, an energy of order uh, logarithm of epsilon, uh, what happens is that you want, I mean, this forces uh, basically U epsilon to be to have modulus very close to one. Um, away from a finite set of points. <coughs> from a union of small balls, small disks, um, around some points. So, okay, you have your points here. Small balls around it of radius roughly epsilon. And uh, anywhere from it you have this uh, uh, you have that your modulus is very close to one because uh, because this energy term really costs a lot if the modulus is away from one. All right, so um, <coughs> and this has been proved rigorously in uh, with different types of uh, of I mean quantifying these things in uh, in several uh, contributions. Uh, so this is this Fabio Di Salon book and then uh, Etienne Sandier, Silva Safati, Bob Gerard. Uh, this list of people have contributed a lot to that. And so uh, here, those points here, you actually have zeros of your field, uh, which, um, I mean, it, you know, you, I mean, maybe you have to have them because S1 has a non-trivial uh, fundamental group. So, uh, 
So you're bound to create uh, similarities. <coughs> and these zeros, they carry a degree. Okay, which is just an integer, and uh, which you can also view as a winding number. I mean, here, away from the circle, you take values into S1, you look at the phase, the number of turns. Yeah, yeah. So you have periodic boundary conditions, so I guess you enforce the degree on the initial data and that then is presumed. So here it's not, um, I mean, I'm not saying anything about, it's just a configuration of, of bounded energy, right? Okay, okay. but in so, principle it could be constant. So yeah, of course, if I, I, mean, if I take a solution, a static solution, like this is uh, zero, I mean, most probably you just have the constant solution. Yeah. So, 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 so to have something non-trivial to start with a uh, so, so the point here is to study the dynamics. So I start with something that uh, that uh, that we force vortices to create, and eventually on a very long time scale, yeah, what you expect is that everything will align in the same direction, and, and so you will just see a constant. So the degree changes in time. Yeah, but as you will see, um, yeah, the, the degree will change in time eventually. But this part where the degree changes in, in time, it's really something that has been understood already. I mean, what we and, and I, will, I will explain the results in the literature about that. But, yeah. Just a quick question. So you, you use a field there, but there is no field right in this problem. Sorry. There is no uh, field in this problem. There is no magnetic field or electric field. So uh, the thing is, when you are near the, the, this Friedrich's transition, you do uh, some kind of expansion, and this, there is a formal way of just getting from this problem to this equation. Uh, just when you are very close to, so there is a small parameter that is that is like the amplitude very close to the condition and, uh, and and actually I think the amplitude you see it somewhere in one of those and then of course I renormalized everything I mean the coefficients I put them I give them special values but it's really the conf the coefficient in front of uh, of you I think that where the field enters in in the formal analysis they make. I don't know how you look at projection or something uh, going to the... We'll, we'll talk about it. So you, you mentioned the degree changes in time, so it's uh, the, the net degree, if I added up all the charges, that changes in time? Or is that conserved on the entire... No, the, also, also the, the full thing will change in time. And I will, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will describe this uh, next, so maybe it will become clearer. You can ask the question again if it's not. Sure, go ahead. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I just keep describing a little bit here this situation and then I'll talk more about the, the dynamics and you'll see, I mean, how it has been described already that the degree changes in time. And, and the reason is, is what uh, Arker said, I mean, that actually, I mean, an equilibrium configuration here, you don't expect it to have, uh, to have uh, singularities. I mean, here it's possible for all of them to align just one direction here perpendicular to the uh, to the field, right? Can I, just, I mean, if you work in the regime, so essentially you will not get a singularity in the field itself, except in the field which is two-dimensional in the center of the Yeah, field. yeah, so here, I mean, okay, you as an order parameter, you could take maybe the projection of this director onto the horizontal plane. Then you really get something two-dimensional. <laughs> So, I mean, really, I, mean, I did not look at how really rigorously derive this equation from this experiment. It's just, I mean, they claim, they, they do it, they do formal analysis, and I said, okay, I mean, now I have this question that actually I don't know the mathematical answer to, and, um, and, uh, and I wanted to understand it. We wanted to understand it. Um, okay, so this type of pictures we saw already yesterday and, and, and during the week several times. Um, and um, one way, I think in particular, in Anika's talk, it was uh, said that uh, to identify the vortices where they are, you can use the j uh, So let me say that again. So this Jacobian is, uh, you look at the determinant of the Jacobian matrix. <coughs> okay. And obviously, if u is smooth with values into S1, uh, this is zero because the Jacobian matrix has the rank one. And the only place where this will concentrate is near the places where you uh, get away from S1. And you have this convergence where basically you have Dirac masses at the singularities and, uh, and the weights are the degrees. 
Okay, and the convergence here, you can just think of it in distributions. Uh, actually, it's in uh, this flat convergence, and you can even go a little bit better. And here, you would have to take a subsequence uh, if you just have this as assumptions. But uh, let's just keep in mind that this is a way, this is one uh, useful way to identify vortices via this, this quantity here. And if you fix the vortices and you want to understand what's the minimal energy when your vortices are fixed, are fixed well, this is basically what was uh, uh, studied uh, in that book by the Arbitral Brazil Selin, among other things. When you fix the vortices and the degrees, um, the minimal energy, it's you pay a fixed amount for each vortex, which, again, we saw that yesterday, is just <coughs> the V squared uh, times this logarithm. And also today in uh, Amit talks, I mean, we saw that computation with the 1 over R that you integrate, it gives you a logarithm. And, uh, and this is the degree squared that, that comes here. And, um, and then the, what they did in that book is that they, uh, they calculated the, the next order term. which is something that depends only on the, where the vortices are and what people call the renormalized energy because you took away this universal infinite part and then you're left with this renormalized energy, right? And um, <coughs> uh, probably we saw the expression of this renormalized energy in some of the talks. Uh, let me uh, just do it again. Um, <clears throat> so there is your phi again, and basically you have this Coulomb uh, interaction. So it's, uh, it is weighted by uh, whether your degrees they have the same sign or not, the different signs, and then you have the logarithm of the distance between vertices. <clears throat> and then well, you have some other terms, but that are regular that uh, that do not blow up when the vertices. Uh, come together, so this is like the main, the most important part of this energy to understand the interaction between the vortices. Um, <coughs> okay, so between the vortices, actually, they were not in the periodic setting, they were in a domain with boundary conditions, but I mean, this is just a... And, um, okay, so now that we have this description of, the, of what, uh, what are the objects we call uh, vortices, uh, let's uh, look at how they evolve uh, under the uh, under the heat flow. So the so okay, there have been many many works uh, about this in the literature. Um, okay, the name. No, so maybe it starts with uh, okay. So first, there were a lot of uh, heuristic uh, calculations that were very interesting uh, maybe by Kobe uh, Rubinstein and a lot of other people. Maybe also in the physics literature. And then the first um, rigorous attempts at uh, giving, uh, making those calculations rigorous, I think, were by uh, Fang Walin, Bob Gerard, and uh, Mete Sonner. Um, then uh, Sandia and Serfati. And the results I want to present here, they are by Zetuel, uh, Orlandi, and Smets. Uh, although, I mean, all those people, this is a long history, and all those people contributed to it, but in the form in which I present them, is really a bit around this mess. And um, okay, this is what it looks like. So if you start uh, with an initial condition that already has formed vortices, so you are in that setting, um, start from, uh, from that situation, uh, then when you send epsilon to zero, uh, and well, you have to change the time scale because this is not the time scale at which uh, uh, vortices uh, uh, move. So in the fast time scale that I will just write down, that will be, I call it S. Okay, so here this epsilon squared is just to correct the fact that uh, 
I, uh, I, I, was, uh, I wrote it in a very, very slow time scale here. And then uh, really you, even in the, in the time scale of the gradient flow, um, they don't move the vertices. You need, you need to, to look at, uh, at an even faster time scale. And um, uh, then in that time scale, you look at your uh, solution new epsilon of the variable s. Um, <coughs> epsilon of s. Of course, it has well-defined vertices in that sense uh, because you started with a logarithmic energy and energy decays. Um, it has well-defined vertices. Let me denote them by a j of s, d j of s, and you have maybe large n of them, and uh, DJs and the n there are uh, there are integers, so they are really piecewise constants. There will be finite number of times in a discrete uh, set of times where you can change the number of vertices, um, n and DJ are piecewise constant in time. So here, when I say as well-defined vertices, you have to understand it as the Jacobian of this uh, map. As epsilon goes to zero, it converges to that. And actually, I mean, you can take a subsequence that does not depend on time, etc. So this is very difficult. <coughs> and the point is, they evolve according to uh, basically the gradient flow of that renormalized energy. Okay, so it's a gradient flow where there are some constants uh, that uh, appear, but basically it's really this gradient flow. So if you are in a time interval where those don't change, it's really this is the evolution. And then uh, there, are, uh, there is a finite set, I mean a discrete set of time where you can have splitting and uh, collisions. So then in which space you have existence of your solution, but then you will have jumps in the time. Right, right so uh, you mean of, of this of this year? Of U of U epsilon of your so, so U epsilon, I mean with epsilon fixed there in is T. I mean, it's, it's very regular, right? No, in T no bit Yeah, in T also, I mean this, when epsilon is fixed and positive, you have you have just a smooth solution, right? It's just when you let epsilon go to zero, then you see the singularities and, and you see these this things happening. So you may have also a multiple uh, uh, degree and you have a split in time. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Which is, which is not happening Which is not happening immediately at the zero time. So it's, it takes time to split. So, okay, this, is, this splitting at zero time, it can happen. And in fact, it's, uh, it's, the, it's our worst enemy here. Um, um, uh, but yeah, and I will I will come to it in, in, a, in a minute. Um, so, but so that's why I, I feel like I did not answer your question. No, because I mean, if you change uh, right now, you go from the final degree that is one to degree two, or uh, so then you should have. A oh yeah, yeah. You have. I mean, in this you have you have singularities. Right, but then. Uh, Oh, uh, that's the limit, right? But the, I mean, your U epsilon in T, when it goes to something, it should have uh, singularities in time, no? Yeah. But they're scaling Otherwise, in time. Uh, you cannot. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, you resolve them by this, by, by the zeros and the way it behaves. Uh, yeah, so it's true, okay, is that you see, and in, you need the uh, epsilon goes to zero, right? So, it's, okay. yeah, but that go ahead. So, uh, the collision and the splitting, this is what happens at times when, uh, uh, when M and DJ. So, um, actually, my purpose here is not to enter into the technical details of these results, just, I mean, to give you the picture so, then, so that I can motivate what's 
May I ask you another question? This uh, uh, A, J, and J, okay, but A, J are defined as above, so like the region around which you have uh, uh, the, the modulus uh, below. Uh, so you can define them by that, by this Jacobian. Yeah. You just you know you have. Uh, they are the limits. They do not depend on epsilon. No, exactly. They don't depend on epsilon. So that's why I mean this is. Uh, okay. I'm being ah, very okay. very vague here, but when I say has well defined vortices, it means you look at the Jacobian, you send epsilon to zero, and the heart of of the things they do in those in this series of papers, it's from the 2000 and uh, etc is really to show that you can take a subsequence that does not depend on time and you can identify the, the limit behavior. Uh, so this is, this is hard, obviously, and I'm not explaining how, how to do it here. I just wanted to, uh, to, to say roughly what the result says uh, so that then I can make the link with what we proved for the initial uh, evolution. Um, okay, so... Basically, you have intervals where you can solve this, and then the dj and the n, they may change, so you may have uh, vortices that come together, or vortices that split if, you, if they had like a large degree, and, uh, and then you go on like that. So they have actually a quite precise description of how these things can happen, and, uh, and you see those are beautiful results, but I don't have time to go into that, really. I just wanted, the most important thing here right now is to uh, say what would be the initial condition for those vortices, because this is what I want to make the link to next. Um, so, let me say initial conditions uh, with uh, quotation marks, uh, because you see that I mean, uh, you cannot really apply cauchy sheets or something like that. Um, so basically, they show also that uh, when s goes to zero, those things they have limits, well defined, and um, and those limits they are related to your initial condition here by what you would like them to do. So the Jacobian of your initial condition it really converges to. Uh, um, to the, this, the vortices given by these limits. Um, <clears throat> so the dj, there are the dj's in the, in the first <coughs> time interval before, I mean the first piecewise constant time interval. Um, but when I read this, you have to be careful that this may be very irregular because here I'm not saying that those limits are all distinct. So you have like several vortices that may come together or rather split from the initial time. So this is not ruled out at all by, uh, by the analysis. So, okay, uh, if I, uh, I can try and have time here, I mean, you may very well have uh, an initial uh, vortex here in the beginning that has, say, degree plus one. Uh, that's, uh, maybe splits into uh, 1 plus 1, 1 minus 1, and 1 plus 1. So the, I mean, the degrees match, it's fine. Uh, and this type of thing can actually not happen later on, because somehow there is the, I mean, this would not reduce the energy if you think of a quantized energy, but what happens is that at the initial time, the energy is not quantized yet. So you really cannot rule out like such, uh, such weird uh, um, configurations here. Uh, by the way, I mean, I'm doing as if they proved all this exactly in that model, but actually they are in the whole plane. So here you have to adapt all these arguments to, uh, to the torus. Uh, but, okay, I just wanted to say this is the spirit, and probably uh, you can adapt all these things. Uh, but you have like uh, 200 pages of, of maths to adapt, so uh, should we not do it, but... Uh, okay. Um, <coughs> So now we want to uh, start with a U0 that does not have the property that the energy is logarithmic, what is, that does not have this property here, and, uh, and understand how we go from a U0 that is maybe very close to zero in most places to uh, how, I mean, do we enter that regime, and if so, how, how fast, etc. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to do it. I'm the part where, where I remember all the times in Leipzig. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe let me keep the, the equation and the energy. You mean cleaning the blackboard in a wet fashion? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> am, I in, am I not doing it right? Oh, it's okay. Pretty good. It's like thick letters. Oh, I see what you meant, maybe, but I left uh, the joke here and I was flat. Um, Alright. Um, okay, so here, what we uh, want to understand is uh, really, I mean, if you start from uh, u0, which is very close to 0, uh, then you see that. I mean, your initial energy, I mean, this doesn't cost much, maybe, but this is uh, very expensive, right? So you have, uh, you have one of our epsilon squared energy. And the question is, I mean, we enter the, 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 the algorithmic regime. Um, how fast? Um, so once, once I'm able to say, okay, I, I, now the energy is uh, logarithmic, I mean, I can make the connection with the results of the general on the instruments. So this is really the connection I want to make. And let me just um, remark that actually, um, if you look at stationary solutions, so this is zero, I mean, there do exist uh, stationary solutions which have very high energy. So, uh, so maybe I'm um, not so high, not as high as this, I think. Well, of course, obviously, just zero. Uh, but like with logarithm squared or things like that. So there are constructions by Serfati and, and co-authors. So stationary solution. So this shows that um, that I mean it's not totally trivial question because I mean if you get stuck in one of those stationary solutions you will never enter your region. Right? But of course we will uh, uh, we have uh, assumptions that will prevent this from happening. And also I think this is actually mentioned in one of the of the papers of Bidwell or Landis Smith as a, as an open problem. So I mean because at first we thought oh, this is weird I mean no one has done this so it must be somewhere. Uh, but, uh, okay, no one has told me yet that it's, it's written somewhere else. Um, okay, so this is one remark. The second remark is that if you look at the scalar case, so if you look at Allen's term, so same equation that now uh, your solution uh, takes values into R. Uh, actually, this type of questions, they, they have been studied a lot. Uh, they are quite well uh, understood, so how you generate interfaces in Allen-Can, um, including works by people in the others. I think, Felix, you have uh, some works about that also, and the other people that I'm forgetting. So this, is, this has been studied a lot, um, and I'm not going to uh, quote uh, all the names, but uh, maybe I'll quote one, which is... Uh, the work of Xin Fu Shen. Uh, he has two papers, 92 and then 04, where he simplifies a little bit the arguments. Uh, because I mean, he uses very elementary arguments that actually inspire us to, uh, to prove our result. Um, all right. So let me just tell you what assumptions we, uh, we make on u0, and then I'm going to give you uh, our theorem. So really, I mean, we, we took some assumptions to, uh, to simplify uh, everything. So uh, first of all, we look at the smooth uh, initial condition. Although 
maybe from the physical point of view, I don't know how smart it is to do that, but okay, we start somewhere. And we have a non-degeneracy assumption that we can write the contact way like that. So uh, this is telling you that if you have a zero, then it must be non-degenerate. In particular, you have just a finite number of zeros, and they all have degree plus or minus one. Um, so if I, uh, if I look at the, the, the free image of zero by, by the zero, this is just z1 to zn, and the degrees, uh, okay, with obvious notation, dj is the degree of the zero around zj, which I can define because the zeros are isolated. Uh, it's going to be plus or minus 1 because I'm assuming that uh, u0 is uh, invertible around it, right? Um, okay, those are strong assumptions, but, uh, but okay, this is maybe the simplest setting where you can ask the question, okay, what happens to those zeros? Do they become vortices? Are there new vortices that appear? Uh, this kind of stuff. And here is the theorem. So uh, if you let epsilon go to zero. Um, so actually, I mean, the results of virtual around this is really you take the limit and then you look at some evolution. Here yeah, it's yeah. just, I mean, we have, a, we have a result that is valid for fixed epsilon, but epsilon has to be small. And every time there is something small or constant, it always depends on my assumptions on u zero. Um, and there is a time. Uh, which is a logarithm, but it's not uh, the same as before. It's, uh, it's almost logarithm of 1 over epsilon, but I have to uh, change a little bit the scale here at the uh, square root of log uh, epsilon. Maybe uh, minus some large constant. Okay, so basically this is, this is the time where you're going to enter the logarithmic, logarithmic regime. And we have, we say, uh, three things. Uh, first, the zeros and the degrees that are conserved until the, up to that time. Uh, okay. We do that like that. Look at the free image of zero by the evolution u of t. It's really just, uh, again, uh, the same number of zeros. Uh, you conserve the degrees. Uh, so, I mean, this is really what you expect. And you can, you can say how far they, they uh, how far away they moved from the initial zeros. And this is precisely the, the scale that is here. Um, and um, so this is uh, for t up to this time, uh, capital T epsilon. And when you arrive at capital T epsilon, um, uh, you really have formed vortices in the sense that away from these things, uh, you really have modulus well away from zero. So here I chose to put larger than one half, but if you want to take any constant close to one, you could also, uh, so not everywhere, obviously, uh, outside. Uh, around the, uh, the zeros. Okay, so in some sense, I mean, everything proceeds as, uh, as you would uh, have expected. The T is your S there? I mean, it's... So no, no, I'm, I'm back to the, the, the scale T that I started with. So this is this time scale here. So basically, in the S scale, this is extremely fast. This is almost instantaneous. So the, 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 all the, the, those two phenomena, they really happen on different time scales. But in T scale, so the vortex starts to move uh, at epsilon square up to... Right, but you see when epsilon is, it goes to zero, I mean, they just don't move, right? No, but in your scale S, they start to move 
if they exist, they will start to move at uh, epsilon squared over a log. Right, but the, so the, the time scale S is, I mean, when you already have energy log epsilon. So here, this is just a different uh, thing, right? The energy here, is, you started with an energy uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. of order one over yeah. epsilon squared. So you really should not think about the arbitrary Landis-Metz setting here. Okay, so more to that scaling of the energy, one over epsilon squared. So you're quite happy in the sense that now you know that uh, you have not created new zeros uh, and none have disappeared and uh, and uh, but you would also like to know that you really enter your logarithmic energy regime and you want to identify the initial conditions that you will start the, this uh, later evolution on the S scale with. So which means you want to identify the Jacobian of your of your solution at, at this time, this final time here, T epsilon. Uh, so those are the two next points of our result. Um, the energy of uh, of my solution after time, uh, after this time is really logarithmic. So here you go, you can start applying the, the results of, uh, of visual around the internet. And uh, if you want to, I mean, really like the full identification, you, you want to know this uh, Jacobian, and this is again what you expect, uh, which is, uh, I mean, really you have. Uh, you have vortices at those points uh, zj0 because in, when you send epsilon goes to zero, to zero, they have not moved actually, and um, and the degrees are the ones just afterwards. Okay, so uh, okay, in some sense there is no surprise, right? This is this is what you would like to happen. Um, Good question. You yeah. you don't have any quanti quanti uh, quantitative information. Capital T epsilon. Oh, uh, the epsilon. Uh, what, what what is it? Uh, yeah, the T oh, okay. Quite nice. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, yeah. um, okay. So maybe just. Um, okay, what should I do? Uh, okay. Let me just say. Okay, this is. Point two and three, this is what you need to then uh, start applying the already known results. Point one, the fact that re uh, vortices, I mean, you don't have zeros that appear or disappear. In some sense, this is not that trivial uh, because uh, there are examples uh, given by uh, Peter Sternberg and, and uh, Kobe Rubinstein where uh, they construct, I mean, initial data where you have no zeros in the beginning and then at some point a zero forms. So obviously, the initial data they have. Uh, it depends on epsilon, and, and this uh, would go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So we, we really avoid, with this assumption, we avoid this type of, of uh, initial data that uh, that Peter uh, that and Toby Rubinstein uh, um, consider. Um, okay. Uh, so the proof is good that I don't have too much time. Oh, no, let me say maybe the most important thing. We completely leave open the question of is there initial splitting. <coughs> I mean, in principle, I mean, I, I guess I, maybe I can safely conjecture that there should not be initial splitting. That uh, that my vortices of uh, plus minus one. I mean, really, when you move into the virtual orland Smith result. Uh, they really stay uh, vortices of the degree plus minus one, but with the information we have, we can really not rule out that picture that I uh, that I drew before, like a plus one vortex splitting into a plus one, a minus one, and a plus one. Um, so this uh, was is quite annoying, but uh, I mean, <coughs> it, it looks like we just did the easy part, and then the hard part we left it for uh, for smarter people. Um, do I have two minutes to say a word about the proof? Okay. So the idea is quite simple and the proof is actually 
quite elementary. I mean, it's not easy because it's quite long. You have a lot of steps, but really, I mean, the, you, we don't use hard tools. I mean, we can do that with, uh, with almost uh, just basic PD. Um, the idea is, OK, determine the energy that dominates um, is the one with the potential, right? So you would like to say that the dominant effect is just the ODE. So basically you would like to just uh, get rid of the diffusion in your equation and say that okay, this, is, this, is the actual, uh, this is the actual evolution I'm seeing, just the, the, under the flow of the ODE. And actually you can, you can quantify that. So you would like to show that uh, u is very close to something that I call v, which is completely exp or, yeah, quite explicit, which is phi of t v of t x, okay, where phi is uh, the flow of my OD. Um, And g of tx, this is the only thing that um, that recalls a little bit that there was diffusion because we have it to satisfy just the heat equation uh, with initial condition u0. Uh, right, so here you see a little bit the diffusion, but just you put it inside the flow. And this is really, I mean, Shin Fu Chen he was already using that type of ansatz to. Uh, to construct a comparison uh, function to, to show that uh, how the, the, the interfaces uh, are generated. So in our case, we have a system, so you cannot really, really use a maximum principle, but just in a few words, what you do, I mean, you, took, you take the difference between the two things, you plug it into the equation, you get an equation for your difference, where you have some linear terms that depend on V, but everything is explicit, uh, and some higher order terms, and your whole job is to, I mean, show that you can neglect the higher order terms and so everything behaves like a linear system. And this is how you get actually quite precise, uh, uh, pointwise estimates, and you can get all these informations here. So let me stop here. Uh,